To become a good angler, whether you're walleye, bass, pike, you have to study the fish and understand the fish. Where the fish wants to live, why it wants to live there, what it wants to eat, what its needs are, what it needs to, to spawn. Okay? If you understand that principle, anytime you can find them, they'll eat a variety of things. You know, uh, we've caught pike on 12-inch swim baits. They won't eat them all the time, but they will eat them. We've caught pike on 3-inch grubs, Berkeley grubs, on a jig head. Okay? If you know where they're living at, then you have to feed them what they want, depending on their activity level. So that's kind of the stuff that I want to cover. If you're an informed angler and understand the fish, you can catch them with a variety of things. We can talk baits later over in the shop. The northern pike, um, he's my favorite critter. If you took it all away from me, uh, the one thing I'd want to keep is pike. Um, I've had a pike fetish since I was eight years old. I mean, when I saw the first one, that's all I've wanted to do is catch pike. They're mean, they hit right next to the boat, they don't care, they fight hard, uh, they'll eat a variety of things. They're tough to catch, the big ones are hard to catch. It's a challenge to me. That's what I enjoy about them. Plus the sheer, the sheer size of the fish that you can catch. So, what you've got, males and females guys, your biggest pike are always gonna be females, which is pretty common in the fish species, all fish species, okay? A, a big pike that's a male is gonna be eight pounds, that's gonna be the biggest, okay? Females, 30, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. Europe, they get some giant fish. Right. Springtime, which is coming up. Now, pike spawn much earlier than the rest of the fish you're going to go after, bass and crappie and such. You're looking at 45 to 48 degrees. The thing you have to understand about them is they don't spawn like a bass where it goes in and makes a bed and fans out of bed. They're, they're broadcast spawners. They don't pair up. Five, females can fer or five males can fertilize one female. What they do is they go into an area six to eight feet of depth with good green vegetation and the female deposits the eggs onto that vegetation. They're extremely sticky and they stick to that. The males then come in and fertilize. You'll see in the springtime before that spawn happens when that water temperature is 42 to 45 degrees, you'll see males courting females. And it's a sight to see. You'll see a female cruising and you'll see three or four males pinned to her side just switching positions like this. It's a courtship like I've never seen out of a fish. And they're just courting her, okay? Then the, the spawn takes place and they go up in the grass and deposit the eggs. So that's the first thing that you have to understand is that they're not, you're not gonna go see a pike bed like you will a bass bed. So here's what happens. The biggest pike that have been caught on record, 99% of them if you do your research, have been caught in water temperatures below 40 degrees. To become a good, I don't care if you're a walleye, bass, pike guy, we all think of those fish as a warm water species, right? Out fishing with our tank top on and our shorts in July and August, right? Well, to become the best at it, you're gonna have to understand that those fish of those species are cold water fish. Look at them as cold water fish. Now, I don't mean like salmon and salmon and steelhead, but think about trying to locate, it. we're done, you can't come in. You're in trouble. Get in here. Look at them as a cold water fish. The bigger the species, be it a walleye, be it a bass, or be it a pike, they want to live at a temperature of 60 to 65 degrees. We think warm water fish, so we always think all year long we're fishing way up shallow for them because they're a warm water fish. The biggest ones aren't. You want to locate that 60 to 65 degrees. The big female pike, because they're a little bit different, it's even cooler for them. So here's what happens. Right now, they're going to be coming out of their basic what, starvation phase, if you want to call it that. Uh, they're going through the winter time right now. They ate heavy in the fall. They went into the winter. When that, when that big storm hit, right before that big storm hit, we were catching big pike. And then that storm hit, the water cooled down a bunch, and they just kind of shut down. And what happens, they may eat once or twice a week, and that's it. They're cold-blooded fish, just like all fish. Their metabolism rate is very slow, so they don't need to eat frequently in the wintertime. What they did is they powered up, just like a bear does before it goes to sleep in the wintertime, it powers up and eats as much as it can to put on as much fat as it can to get through that sleeping phase. Well, what the females are doing, as, long, as well as the males, but more importantly for the females, is they're eating as much as they can in the fall. The reason why they're doing it is because they got eggs inside that have to brood. So they gotta have fat reserve to brood those eggs. Coming into February, 
And say the middle of February is usually when it kicks off for us. If there's still ice in spots on Coeur d'Alene, we're ice fishing. If the Pend Oreille River's clear, we're smelt fishing out there. What you want to do is you want to start fishing middle of February. I know it's cold, I know it's miserable, but that's when they're going to start feeding more frequently because they're getting closer. What's happening to our daylight, guys? Starting at 5 o'clock, starting to get lighter, right? It's not always, activity level's not always based off of just strictly temperature. Just like us, we're like, you get off of work, you're like, oh, it's still light outside. Yeah, I can run out and home and do this or whatever. Well, you start to get excited. The fish does the same thing. The walleye start going, good. Middle of February, the days are getting longer. Roosevelt's starting to drop. There's things, the water's moving. Still cold, but the day, days are getting up to 40s, right? We're seeing some 40 degree temperatures. That's what gets them excited. So your first phase that you're gonna go through in the springtime is you're gonna be fishing deep breaks. And you wanna be in a, let's just take a bay here. <coughs> and if it's on a river or it's in Coeur d'Alene Lake, Ponderé River and Coeur d'Alene Lake, Hayden Lake, that's where I do all my pike fishing because that's where the most of them live, okay? But if we had a, a, say a bay like this, we know the back end of this bay in the summertime has a lot of vegetation in it. That's good spawning for them, right? For the bass and for the pike. We know the vegetation is going to be in there. Those fish aren't going to push up shallow right away. What they're going to do, it's like we talk about our percentage triangle thing, and I talk about this till I'm blue in the face because it works so well. What you're going to find, is everybody familiar with contour lines? When you look at a map, the tighter the lines, the steeper the break, the further they are, the, the shallower the slope, okay? What they're going to do is they're going to be out in this area here. They're going to be off a steep break adjacent to, when you hear adjacent to, their spawning grounds. This is where they want to end up. This is where they're going to be at right now. That deep water is a refuge for them. If the conditions change, if a cold front comes through, they just go out in them deep holes, 17, 18 feet, 30 feet, depending on the lake, Ponderé River, maybe it's only 17 feet. And they'll lay in these holes. And they're just waiting for those conditions to change. So what you're going to do the most common way to go out in the springtime or, or early winter like, or late winter like this, excuse me, is to go out and smelt and bobber fish, bait fish rig. If you're drilling through the ice, you're doing the same thing. Basically all it is is you're taking a dead herring or a dead smelt, hooking it up on a double hook rig or a Swedish hook rig, dropping it down and letting them take it. Now the thing about a pike, what makes them so unique that I enjoy is they're a scavenger as well as a top of the line predator. If something's laying there dead, they're going to take it down. Okay? If something's screaming past them, they're going to take it down. This time of year when the metabolism is slow and things are they're cold, what do you do? If you can fish something slow that's easy to catch, like dead bait, that's not moving, smells good, looks right, they're going to come up and eat it. Because they don't have to expend a lot of energy to do it. Any frogs, any uh, uh, water dogs, anything in there that's died, fish, winter kill happens a lot. Oxygen levels deplete, your smaller fish can't make it. Winter kill happens. That stuff all settles down to the bottom and they just kind of go around scooping it up. Bullhead catfish that are sitting down there, not moving. They come through and just suck them right up. So you can dead bait them. You want to dead bait right on the edge of those breaks. If it does happen to get nice, what they'll do is they'll come up and just cruise a little bit up into this shallow area to get a little warmth, but they're not going to go way up in. I go out pike fishing early, early in the year, and you'll see guys way back up in these bays. They're not here yet. They're out in this deeper water because they want to slide off if things get bad. But yet they can come up to this bank and catch a little sunlight. Okay? Warmth of a, just a few tenths of a degree gives them energy to go feed. So you're starting out in your deeper water this time of year. And dead bait's gonna be the best thing. Now, if you're an efficient hardware fisherman, um, me, I like to use a casting and retrieving technique of some sorts. Be it a big, soft plastic jerk bait that I can twitch really slow and let it sit there. I'm just not really efficient at watching a bobber. I like to move it, jerk, suspending jerk baits. If you have a day where, say you started out, and the thing you gotta keep in mind with this, guys, just like we do with the walleyes and all of it, at this time of year, is we start out in the morning deep, in the deep hole, and as the daytime progresses, if you get a bright sky like this, as the daytime progresses, those fish are going to push up shallower. Because what? Just like when we step outside in the sun right now, it may be 30 degrees out, but the sun beats on us and it feels warm. 
correct? Same thing for them. If they're down in those holes, they're not getting much of that light penetration. They're not getting that heat. So they slide up out of the deeper water, go up to the shallows, mill around for a couple hours, and then come back down. So traditionally what we would do is, in the wintertime, if, if you were going to smelt fish, you're throwing your smelt and you're setting it up, you're in a 17-foot hole off a break and adjacent to a flat, you set it up and you're down 16 feet, 16 and a half feet. We always try to keep our smelt, if possible, 18 inches off the bottom, somewhere in that zone. So it, it stands out a little more than something just laying on the bottom. As it starts to progress in the daytime, the sun comes up and things start to warm up, you start to see your graph go up a couple tenths of a degree. Then what we want to do is we want to either move in shallower with our smelt or do like I like to do and throw suspending jerk baits. Husky jerk. I've got some river to sea jerk baits in there. Whatever. Something that's a suspending jerk bait. You know, three, four inches. Something that's small, fishing it slow. So you would cast it out, reel it down. And I mean, when you're talking jerk baits, when you see guys on TV, you know, they're doing this ticket and really working them hard. Well, that's when fish are active. What you're doing is you're just literally like this, pop the rod tip and you let it set. And you just sit there and maybe a minute goes by and then you pop, pop, little tiny pops. Because what those fish have done, that jerk bait's only going down two, three, four feet depending on the model. What it's doing, those fish are sitting up in the shallow, basking in the sunlight. They may be over 10, 12 feet, but they're just underneath the surface getting warmth. And that jerk bait goes by and you're keeping it in the strike zone, fishing it slow, it's easy for them to catch, they'll take it. As it starts to drop and the sun starts to go down and starts to cool down, you progress back out to that break again. So you follow them from deep to shallow. Deep to shallow. Now, like last year, we had that big massive flood. Okay? Ten-year flood. Seems like it happens every ten years around here. We have that happen. What happens, and it's going to happen this year, and you won't have it as drastic, hopefully, as it was last year, but any time the stuff floods, so say we've got our shoreline like this, at our bay. And guys, which, which side of the, which side of, if this is, if this is a north and this is south, which bay warms up the fastest? North. Good job, north. Because the sun's southern. So it's getting more exposure on this side here. So this is always going to warm up. So you always want to fish your northern sides first. That's just a little quick sub deal for you. So say we have something like this. Then I'll draw my percentage triangle thing here again. Like so. And in the springtime, I'm constantly watching river flows and elevations and stuff because it's telling me what I need to do. So remember, we were fishing out here because the lines were tighter. This was a deeper break. And the triangle would look something like this when I talk about triangles. This is the tip. This is the base. This is the spawning. I don't ever mark the, the, the spawning area on the triangle because everybody knows where it's at. You go in there and you see fish, you see bass. You always know where that's at, back end of it. So what happens is these fish were here and you caught them there until, say, the water started coming up in middle of March. And this grass, old grass, it's not going to be green yet, old grass starts flooding. What we'll do, we went from working out here now we're starting to work into here. Now you may start out first part of the day, and by this time I'm not throwing any dead bait. And you can fish dead bait all year long if you want, middle of summer, fish it. They'll eat it all the time. I just don't like it. They tend to swallow it and I kill the fish and I like to release my fish. But we'll be back into the base of this, and what you'll find out in the morning time, once again, because they're starting out deeper, but they're not all the way out here. Now they're kind of living off of this break here. What happens as it starts to warm up, they push shallow. Now what they're doing is they're cruising around, they're investigating this area up in here because the water's come up and these areas have started to flood. March and April, Coeur d'Alene Lake, it just depends which warms up faster than the river does a lot of time because the river's flowing. When your water temperature is getting into the oh, 45 to 50 degree range, what you're going to find is these fish, and that's surface temperature now, okay, because it's going to be cooler down below, correct? What you're going to find is these fish will be pushing up into these shallows. Now what you're going to do is you're going to start throwing small paddle tail swim baits like a Berkeley hollow belly, uh, small uh, you know, daredevil spoons, uh, depending on the weeds. If it's real weedy, you're going to have to throw like a Johnson silver minnow. Something that you can control that only goes down a foot and a half or so. 
Because what you'll find is those pike, if it's like this, and here's your surface, and this is your vegetation, and here's your bottom, and you're reading, say, a foot and a half, it's probably realistically three feet because the weeds are so thick. And what you'll find is these pike are laying right in that, and they're getting maximum sun. So what you're trying to do is bring something across the top of this to draw these guys out right here. This is the pre-spawn period. When you start reading on your graph and you're seeing that 45 to 50 degree temperature on your graph, this is when you want to be fishing shallow because they're going to be active, active. Now what they're doing is making the final big feed before they go to spawn. And the spawning requires a lot of energy out of them because they'll go full fo focus on the spawning and they won't feed for a while. So what you're doing is you're working baits across the top. What's going to happen here is you're going to pick up a ton of males. You're going to get a ton of males because the males are extremely active. And what happens is you just got to keep plugging away because if, uh, here's a prime example, if I went into a, a daycare and there was uh, 20 little screaming kids running around there like my two-year-old daughter and I throw an Oreo cookie on the ground, you know, I'm 300 pounds, wah, trying to get to this Oreo cookie and you got 20, 20 pounders, I'm not going to get to that Oreo cookie before them, okay? It's just not going to happen. So what happens, and this is when you'll find the males and females together, right now. You'll find the females in that early, you know, uh, late winter time, you'll find them all together out there. You catch one big female, they'll be out there together. They're not pike or territorial, except for this time of the year, cold water periods, they'll group up. So what you have to do here is just keep plugging away. You may fish all day long and you may get 20 fish and they're three to five pounds, but you'll get one that's big. It's just persistence because your odds are so much greater hooking that male than that female. So you just gotta stick with it. This time of year when it floods, and Pend River River's great for this, as is Coeur d'Alene, but when this thing floods, they get up in that grass, this is the most exciting fishing you're gonna do. Because you'll throw it out into an area where it looks like there's no water at all, You'll have your electric motor all the way up as high as it'll go, and you'll be bringing that thing along, and all of a sudden you'll just see a wake come. Wake just come flying to it. Best thing to do, put your head down and just keep reeling. As I guarantee you, everybody that goes with me for the first time, what? And they set the hook and the fish is like six feet away. You know, you get, all of a sudden you got reaction times, you know, you're like superhuman. Just put your head down and just keep reeling and just wait till you feel tension. Now with pike, what you'll find, staying on that note of hook set, when you look at a bass's mouth, his mouth's round, correct? Uh, walleye's mouth is kind of a, an in-between a, a bass and a pike. It's got a little bit of a nose. Pike's got a big old bill on him, all right? What I try to tell people with pike, the slower you set the hook, the more fish you're going to catch. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's 100% true, and it's through my experiences. When a bass pulls it in, you set the hook. Mouse round, correct? With that pike, he's got that big old bill there. So that bait has to travel farther to get inside. What you want to do when you throw it out and you're bringing it in, when that fish hits, just pause a second. It's like fish in top water. Just pause a second. What that does is allows that bait to travel inside for that fish to turn and get hooked in the corner of the mouth. If you are missing a lot of pike, and say you missed six or seven pike, and then you finally got one in, and it was hooked through the snout out here on the end, that's an indicator to you that you're setting the hook way too soon. You know, pike are notorious followers. They'll follow you in, and when they strike, it's fast and it's violent. Just hesitate a second. Just... Mother, I'm in the middle of business right now. I'll call you back. Uh-huh. Can you believe I didn't turn my cell phone off? How rude was that? Mother probably seeing if I need some cookies or something. Are you okay, dear? But anyway, you want to pause. Please pause on it. It is the hardest thing for you to do because when they hit it, when they're going, they try to take the rod right out of your hand. No joke. They will, they, if you're not ready for it, they will try to take it out of your hand. Problem is, a lot of the pike fishing is visual. You see that 20-pounder coming, oh, it's the biggest fish of my life, and you blew it. So just pause, wait to feel tension, and then set the hook.